Hello, welcome to Stanley Road Baptist Church. Uh, greetings uh, from us as we continue these online services. Um, and while we're, while we're worshipping here in your front room uh, on this online video, I just want to remind you that at 9 and 10.30 in the church, there are services going on, so there are worshippers there as well. And while you're worshipping, I hope and I pray that despite the fact that you can't be uh, in the building with us, we know that your hearts are with us. And we pray that you will feel, we will feel bound to all the other believers who attend Stanley Road um, in Christian love. Or maybe even don't, but you're feeling part of our community because you're worshipping with us. So it's always worth remembering that we worship as part of our community. Now, uh, we're still reading the book of James as we continue to seek what the Lord is trying to say to us uh, today. Um, and James, of course, we've got to that chapter where he talks about how uncontrollable the tongue is, how our speech um, can do all sorts of evil or even all sorts of good. So I thought it was worth uh, reading uh, part of a psalm, Psalm 34, which really speaks about how we can use our voices, use our tongues and our mouths for God's glory. So let's read part of Psalm 34 now. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Amen. So we hope and pray this morning that you're able to cry out to God, to praise his name, to use your lips and your mouth and your tongue and your physical body and your audible sound to praise his name. And we're going to do that in, in just a moment. Uh, we've got another uh, recording of the Evangelical uh, Ministry of Wales conferences uh, where they sung, Breathe on me, Breath of God. Now that's a song that cries out to God and says, I need your Holy Spirit in order to be changed. I need your Holy Spirit in order to do good in the world. I need your Holy Spirit to be more like Christ. Pre please send it to me. And while we read uh, through James, we're going to get to some really gritty stuff that's going to certainly make us feel and reveal to us. Um, how evil we can be in God's eyes. And it's worth reminding that we have the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives so that we can do those acts of righteousness that prove our faith in him. So raise your voices in a moment and sing uh, with the Evangelical Ministry of Wales, um, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. But before we do that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are here. Wherever this recording is played, if there are hearts crying out to you for rescue, for salvation, for companionship, for love, for crying out to you in praise, you are there ministering with them. And I pray, Lord, that whoever is worshipping through the use of this video, Lord, that they will know that they are bound together in Christian love and by the Holy Spirit with those who are worshipping elsewhere, 
whether it's in front rooms, whether it's in the church building. I pray, Father, that they would know that we are all one in Christ Jesus. So Lord, prepare our hearts now to worship you. Help us to be still, to know that you are here. Give us a moment, Lord, to confess our sin to you and to know that we are forgiven and that your grace has been extended to us and you've sent your Holy Spirit to transform our lives so that we can walk in your ways and you call us righteous. In your Son's name, in the power of your Holy Spirit, Amen. It's time to pray. Uh, in our online services, we always try to give you an opportunity to pause, be still, and, and bring something to God in prayer. Uh, so I thought it would be good to, uh, do, to have some prayer for our schools. Um, it probably hasn't escaped your attention uh, that while uh, hospital numbers are kind of okay, and certainly deaths seem to be remaining low from COVID, uh, the Delta variant is sweeping through our country and it has impacted our local area to some extent. Um, but perhaps the biggest uh, personal and emotional impact has been on our schools and particularly the children who are being asked to isolate at the moment uh, because um, they've been in contact with somebody who's got COVID or they've got COVID themselves. I think we can underestimate how frightening uh, this is for children. Uh, to be asked to go home, particularly very young children, uh, because they're sick or they might be sick, and how much pressure it puts on parents who are already strained from a very difficult um, 18 months, and how that really just puts so much pressure uh, on families and where things could go, could go badly wrong. I also need to think of the teachers who've been through a really tough uh, couple of years, and um, they will be absolutely drained, and despite all of their efforts, they, there have been circumstances that have just meant they haven't been able to do their jobs as well as they'd like, and they will be feeling dissatisfied. So we need to pray for our schools and for our children. Now, uh, NISCU, uh, Northern Interschools Christian Union newsletter, uh, came to my email this week. I'm going to circulate it out through MailChimp, um, so if you don't 
receive it that way, then do um, ask me and I can, I can send you out a link. Or actually, I can put the link into the YouTube video uh, comments as well, so it'll be down there too. And they're sharing their news. They've, of course, had a very uh, tedious uh, couple of years because they haven't been able to go in schools and be a physical presence there. They would normally bring God's stories and the gospel um, into schools. Um, but they have been able to have an awful lot of online interaction, and um, particularly producing videos and supporting uh, schools with their religious and worship programs there. Um, so the feedback from the videos, uh, the disassemblies and other things that they've been doing has been very good and they have learned new skills. But um, recently, particularly Johnny has been able to uh, restart Year 7 Drop-In Club at Our Ladies. Uh, so we need to pray for that and also has been able to contribute at Ripley. But pray for, for Johnny and Diana because they, they, it has been extremely frustrating for them not to be able to do their jobs in person that they would have liked. Um, but there are some good things happening. So uh, they'll be visiting around 16 local schools with moving on lesson for year sixes to help the year sixes make a smooth transition from primary to high school. That will be incredibly important this year because a lot of that usual transition stuff um, hasn't happened. Um, and looking forward to uh, teaching about the story of Joseph and thinking about the ups and downs he's had in his life and how those experience shapes their future. So gonna put up some prayer requests for NISCU on the next slide and some prayer requests for our school and for our children who are being impacted um, very much at the moment by COVID and by having to isolate from school. Well, it's time now to open up God's Word. Um, we've been enjoying, enjoying over the past few weeks reading in the book of James, James's letter to the early church. And we see how he's so concerned for their spiritual health. And he's not afraid to uh, say things to them which are difficult and which are challenging. Because in his heart, he desires for them to uh, follow Jesus with their whole heart. Now, last week we were considering those words that faith without deeds is dead. And we're not saved by grace alone, but the acts of righteousness that God gives us to walk in are evidence of the faith that we have. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be getting down to the gritty things, the actual details of uh, the sins that were happening in some of these church communities and the things that James is warning them of to turn around and, and follow Jesus' way and follow the wisdom of, that comes from heaven, not the earthly wisdom that is leading them into conflict with each other and conflict with God. So we're in the book of James, chapter 3, and we're going to read the whole chapter. So let's read now. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, 
we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Amen. What's the worst thing that you've ever said? I don't know what's popping into your mind right now, but I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't want to repeat it out loud ever again. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the worst thing I ever said was, but I do know that I'm someone who has the ability to say the wrong thing at just the right time to upset someone and to cause trouble. And I do my best to stop it, but it's usually just because I think it's funny and I'm not taking things very seriously. Now, it reminded me of that old Cold War story. The President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, at the height of tensions with the USSR, SR was due to make a radio broadcast and when they were testing the microphones he made a joke said the United States was going to bomb USSR in five minutes. Now that joke wasn't broadcast but people heard about it and somebody got a hold of the recording and, and broadcast it eventually and it ended up with huge tension uh, rising. The USSR military being put on high alert and um, things getting worse between those two countries. Now we don't all have the same power as a president like Ronald Reagan, but we are all um, betrayed by our own lips, by our mouths. We haven't got control over those parts of our body and a lot of the time when we speak it reveals what's in our hearts. It reveals that despite the fact that human beings are made in the image of God, we have a fallen nature. It shows our disorder. It shows our distortion. And I think every time we say something which causes damage to friends, family, loved ones, to our own reputation, it devastates us because we, we know that it's showing our character and our faults and our flaws. But you don't have to be a Christian to know that. It's universal. It's a truism. The whole world knows that. Everyone from the politician to the smallest child knows that their mouth can get them into loads of trouble. Now, 
those things which are true for everyone and everyone wants help with are dealt with in the Bible by wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is like the self-help books that we have today. Uh, they're guidance on how to behave, how to act, how to be successful in life. So in fact, when James in James chapter 1 and verse 19 says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, he's lifted that pretty much straight out of some of the wisdom literature that was written um, in his day. In uh, Proverbs, which is the most obvious book in the Bible, which is full of, this kind of these wise sayings, these advice for life, uh, we will be familiar with a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Or in Proverbs 16, um, a scoundrel plots evil, and on their lips it is like a scorching fire. A per perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. A violent person entices their neighbor and leads them down a path that is not good. All of these warnings, the fact that speech can be used for great evil, and it's out of control, but it also has this huge power. So what we're actually reading, the most of that chapter today, is James giving the early Christians a little bit of heavenly wisdom. So the first thing that James teaches us is that speech is impossible to control. And he starts with a warning. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. So why shouldn't we become teachers? When James uses the word teacher, he's talking about a teacher in church, which is really just anyone who picks up a Bible, tries to interpret it, and tries to teach others about how they should live according to God's word and to actually reveal the truth of Scripture. Now, at the moment, right now, that's me, but it could be any one of you. Uh, who has the ability and feels like uh, they've got the calling to, to pick up a Bible and to teach others. Now the problem with teaching is that you use your mouth, you use your speech, your tongue is employed to do it. And you're using that tongue to guide others in the way that they should go. That means everything you say is going to come under scrutiny. And just because someone has the gift of speech, the ability to stand up in public and to speak confidently, doesn't mean that they're virtuous in any other way. It doesn't mean that they're good. We tend to make this assumption in Christian circles that if someone's able to teach from the Bible, that they must somehow be holy as well. But the one thing doesn't necessarily follow the, others, the other. And there's plenty of evidence in the Christian world, for people who we've looked at, just because they can teach well, we have assumed that their hearts are right as well. Teachers are just humans, like anyone else. And just like a human, it's possible for the teacher to trip up and stumble and not speak good, but speak evil. And we can't keep our speech in check more than anyone else. We all stumble. That means teachers are going to be judged more harshly just because they use more words. Thinking about uh, being judged for your words, I was thinking about our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, another world leader. Now here's a man who loves words, and he loves using them colourfully, robustly, as he would say, and uh, using exaggeration and uh, using really harsh language against his enemies. But now he's leader of the country, he's finding that every word he says is being scrutinized and is being uh, brought into check. And a few of the things that he has said in private are now coming back uh, to haunt him as, as they're being leaked into public. That must be incredibly frustrating for a man who loves just to speak freely and, and not think that his speech has any consequences. We all stumble. None of us can control our tongues. So what does that mean for us as Christians? 
Well, let's go to the end of that chapter because there's a couple of things about wisdom at the end of this chapter that are important to us. At the end of the chapter, James talks about two types of wisdom, earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And as Christians, we want to get the heavenly wisdom that is going to give us life. Now, he lists uh, the heavenly wisdom. It's pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Now, when you hear the word mercy, you might think back uh, to the uh, to last couple of chapters when James said that we need to judge with mercy and that mercy triumphs over judgment. So when someone trips in the words that they say, we need to judge them mercifully. When a cross word is said, when someone is really upset or angry about something and they say some things which are incredibly hurtful, how do we deal with that? Do we hold on to those words and throw them back at them um, to hurt them back? Or do we just treat them as words to the wind? I say words to the wind. When someone's upset or angry, they say all sorts of things that they don't really mean. And it's an evil to hold on to those things and, to, and to, um, to hold them against them and to not forgive them. Words to the wind. We need to judge each other mercifully because we would like to be judged mercifully and feel like we can say some things uh, that perhaps um, aren't what we mean and be forgiven for them. Or what about when someone does reveal their innermost thoughts, their heart, by their words? And they reveal that they're sinful with their words. Are we going to judge them harshly? Or are we going to judge with mercy? Well, we're all sinful. And we're all going to be judged by the one law, uh, the law that gives life. And we ought to judge mercifully. Be ready to forgive. Thinking of that uh, cricketer, uh, Ollie, uh, who was discovered that... Um, in his uh, Twitter feed, he'd said some racist and sexist things when he was 16 years old, and he was being held accountable for them now. And uh, he, he did everything he could. He apologized publicly. And despite that, he still got suspended. Um, and maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but it did seem like there wasn't a willingness to forgive him. And that uh, an important moment in his career is now marred uh, by that incident. James says no human being can tame the tongue. The second thing that James teaches us is that speech has power. Words can do stuff. Now, the illustration that he gives is a bit in a horse's mouth. Uh, so there's a metal bit that goes in the horse's mouth and the reins are attached to it and you can turn it. But not many of you ride horses these days, I don't think. So we can maybe think of it as a steering wheel in a car. Car is nice and big, but all you need to do is turn that steering wheel a little bit, and you can do it with one finger with power steering, and the whole car will turn. Words have power to do things, and the tongue has great power. And uh, even though that's a little bit the bridle in the horse's mouth, it can turn something enormous. Thinking of uh, some words that have had huge power in the last year in, in, in our whole world, really. That poor man, George Floyd, when, when he was murdered, the three words that he said, I can't breathe. Despite the fact that his whole body couldn't move in that moment, the only thing he could move was his tongue. The only thing that he could do was say some words. And yet those words, painfully so, mobilized a whole culture, a whole nation, um, and lots of different countries in the end, um, whether for good or for bad, but those words had huge power. All he could move was his tongue, and yet uh, he started something with those words, I can't breathe, which went around the whole world. The next illustration that James uses is ships. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Now, I'm sure the ships in James's day seemed very large, uh, but they're nothing compared to the size of the super tankers we have today. 
And of course, we'll all, re all remember uh, when the Ever Given was blocking the Suez Canal. Unfortunately, the rudder didn't quite do its job well enough that day. But even those huge super tankers have a tiny rudder in comparison to the size of the ship. And yet that tiny thing is able to steer. Um, words have power. I think something else that's very vulnerable is that a baby, even a child, a baby who hasn't even got proper speech yet has got power with their tongue. So all that baby needs to do is, go, is scream and mummy and daddy come running and will do whatever that baby wants them to do. In fact, they might spend five minutes trying to figure out whether the baby needs a nappy change, whether they need feeding, whether they just need soothing or burping. And mummy and daddy are controlled by the tongue of that baby, even though it can't speak proper words. Words have power. There are some words in the English language that have huge power to do good. What about those three words, Jesus loves you? How many hearts have those touched over the centuries? What about the words, I forgive you? or even, I'm sorry. The words blessed are the meek. That speech has transformed um, our hearts and transformed our society. But the fact is that words don't always have power for good. And in fact, they can have great power for evil. So when we don't speak, I love you, but I hate you. Um, the damage done to that life can be for a long time and irreversible. And even those parents who are controlled by the screaming of the baby, they have a choice to speak in soothing tones or using harsh words. And each of those things will have an impact on that child. Because James talks about the evil that the tongue can do in its power. And he uses the illustration of a fire, and a fire represents destruction. The tongue also is a fire. A great forest can be set in fire by a small spark. How about that day in January, the Capitol Hill in Washington, when President Trump and his allies had a choice as to what words they would use with that crowd. They could either uh, speak soothing words and calm things down, or they could fire them up. And they chose the fire option that led to great destruction. That's what James is talking about here when he says that uh, a small spark can set a great forest on fire. The tongue is a Fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. James is painting an extremely negative picture of speech of the tongue of mouths here. But the fact is, the gift of speech is one of the greatest that has been given to human beings. We can communicate we can build knowledge up over generations until we can have this huge achievement of the technology and knowledge we have today. We can do that because of speech and we can influence the world around us because of speech. It is one of the things that most clearly shows that we're made in the image of God. And like so many of the good gifts that God has given us, we can turn it to evil. Verse 14, talking about earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. Um, James says, it comes from bitter envy and selfish ambition. We turn speech to evil because of envy and selfish ambition, fueling an earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom. A philosophy which justifies greed and contention. A desire to succeed for my sake at the expense of others. 
Think of what speech is actually used for, what our tongues can be used for. Violence. Speech is always involved in violence. It's never just um, physical violence. There's always speech involved as well. Coercion, controlling someone through their emotions and manipulating them. Lying, deceiving others for gain or concealing our sin. Fraud. Every time you pick up the phone to a phone scam or you see a text that's a scam, that's word, speech being used to defraud and to carry out evil. What about the grooming of children and vulnerable adults? Soft words, manipulation used for someone to get their own way, for their own satisfaction, to satisfy their own desires. Gossip and slander. Isn't it devastating to hear that someone has used their tongue, used their words to say something evil about you behind their backs? Or even we use the tongue to justify those evil acts and to say why it's right that we should gossip or lie or commit fraud or coerce people or even step into violence. And to seduce. One of the greatest evils we can do with our tongues is to use the words, I love you. Not because they're true, but so that we can get what we want. Corrupting precious words in order to take advantage of someone. The evil of the tongue. And nothing reveals to us more clearly that we need saving from our own sin as a culture, as a people, as a species, than the fact that we can't control the evil of our own tongues. We take this great gift that is capable of immense power and we do great evil with it. As human beings, we need saving. We need changing. James knows that his Messiah has come and with his Messiah has come the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit has the power to finally change humans' hearts and turn them to God and help them to do wonderful, blessed, glorious, righteous things with their power rather than carrying out evil. God offers us forgiveness through the death of his Son. He offers us a new way to live. And what you need to do is repent, be baptised into the church and walk in the way of truth and life as a restored human being. So if you haven't taken that step yet, every time you get tripped up by your tongue or tripped up by your actions and it reveals the evil in your heart, you know that you need to come to Christ for salvation. So speech is impossible to control. Speech is also powerful, not least it has the power to reveal the evil in our own hearts. Speech in the tongue is also duplicitous. It is hypocritical. It's two-faced. James makes the perfect example here that we totally get straight away. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You cannot praise God with your mouth and then curse your neighbour. It turns the praising of God into a lie. It corrupts it and destroys it and makes it worthless. Now we're getting into now exactly what is going wrong in some of these uh, faith communities, some of these churches in the first century that James is writing to. But back in those days, a curse was a little bit more formal, a little bit more serious, and it was literally calling God, asking God to do something evil in the life of the person you were cursing, the person that you hated. 
Uh, we don't do that very often nowadays, but we do still use curse words. We do, do still speak evilly about our neighbours and we're quite happy sometimes to say unkind words to those um, who we feel we have a right to because they have wronged us in some way. Now, James is talking to the early church, but I want you to notice something because it's very important here. He doesn't say you, he says we. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. That reminder again, that despite the fact that James is the teacher, he's the leader of the church, and he's writing this letter because it's important, his position as a teacher, and he has things to teach the church that have come from God. And despite all of that, he's just as susceptible to sin, just as corrupt as the people he's writing to, and just as much in need of salvation. This is where James just shows his grace over and over again. He's not standing up on a pedestal, pointing down at them. He's saying, this is what we're like. And you know what, brothers and sisters, it shouldn't be like this. Let's fix it. This double-mindedness of praising God with the same mouth that you curse your brother and sister is a theme that James is really going to pick up on. But the point is, you can see it. You're loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, at least on the surface, but you're actually showing hatred for your neighbor. So you've already broken that command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we've only got to go to Jesus for the ultimate example, haven't we? He's hanging on the cross, about to die, and he's looking down at the people who put him there, some of whom literally nailed him to that cross, others who shouted, crucify him. And he could have called a curse down from heaven upon them, but he didn't. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or what about in the upper room when Judas is trying to find an excuse to leave so he can go and um, sell Jesus out and get 30 pieces of silver. I sense sadness in Jesus' voice when he says to him, just go and do whatever you're going to do, but do it quickly. Jesus, in that moment, could have called an avenging angel on Judas and stopped him from betraying him. But he didn't. He showed him mercy. Now what Judas did with that mercy was up to him and he chose to carry on and do evil. But Jesus showed mercy. James is saying, I'm not quite complete and mature yet. There's still areas of my life that occasionally uh, evil comes out and neither are you. There are still parts of us that are controlled by envy and selfish ambition. Same mouth used to sing praises, to pray, to read scriptures, used to spit hate at your neighbor, or gossip, or slander, or manipulate, or justify your sin, or lie, or do any of those things you can do with your tongue. That's the tongue that you praise God with. The problem with speech is we can't control it. Whatever is in our hearts comes out of our mouths, whether we like it or not. James's message is be wholehearted for Jesus. The wisdom that comes from heaven that he talks about at the end of the chapter is pure. It's pure and it's focused on Jesus and it's 100% sold out for him. So is he the Lord of your life or is he simply a teacher? whose advice you can ignore. Because the life of a follower of Jesus is all out. I give him everything. And I follow him no matter the cost. I reject earthly wisdom. And I pursue the wisdom that comes from heaven. So the message is, don't try to control your tongue. You can't do it. It's already out of control. And that's scary because your tongue is powerful and it can do great hurt 
or it can do healing. It has power to heal, it has power to hurt. It's already out of control. So what you need to do is receive with meekness the word implanted in you, which is able to save your soul and let that change you. And in the end, the spirit within you will be controlling your tongue and you will only use it for righteousness. Your word it was good, it's ever faithful, worth more than gold, the heart's delight. Your word gives life to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Your word is true, it never changes. It formed the earth, sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my path. Thank you for worshipping with us. Uh, we're overjoyed that you're continuing uh, to benefit uh, from these videos which go out and you're continuing to take part in the worship of Stanley Road Baptist Church. We would love to hear from you. 
So if you want to get in touch for any reason, if you, even if it's just to say hello, then please do by those various channels, email, phone, um, and WhatsApp, uh, wh whatever you want to do, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. I um, want to remind you of a few things that are important uh, that are coming up. Um, probably the most important is if you are a church member, there is a members meeting on the 13th of July at 7 p.m. So members meeting on the 13th of July at 7 p.m. Now the plan for that um, is for it to be a blended meeting. Um, we'll see whether we can make that happen or not according to COVID restrictions, but at the moment that is the plan. So there will be a Zoom link, but you may be able to come and meet in person as well. Uh, want to remind you that the cafe is now becoming a regular thing. It's happened successfully for two weeks in a row. It's been a huge blessing for those who are serving and hopefully a blessing for those who are coming along as well. So do show up on Tuesday between 10 and 12 if you want a cup of tea and a good chat and perhaps uh, even um, hear a little bit about Jesus perhaps in one of those conversations. Um, and finally, our house groups course are meeting this week. So I want to remind you that there's a meeting in person, hoping there's a Zoom one this week as well. So if you want to get uh, involved in that, then get in touch um, if you're not already involved and uh, we'll, we'll slot you in somewhere and that will be a joy and a pleasure. Now it's interesting this week speaking about how uh, the tongue and the mouth and James starting off with that warning for teachers that you shouldn't want to be a teacher because you have to speak a lot and there's more chances of you saying things wrong. But if there's anything that has impacted you today for good or for bad in, in the words that have been spoken, in the prayers that have been prayed, uh, then once again, we're, we're open door. Do get in touch and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so let's pray our closing prayer. Um, as we close out our service and we prepare ourselves to go out um, into the world, bringing the light and life of Christ and heavenly wisdom to the community around us. Father God, as we go from here, we pray we will grow in our understanding of your love for us in Christ. And may we know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we show your love to others for your glory, forever and ever. Amen. Your word is good, it's ever faithful, worth more than gold, the heart's delight. Your word gives life. Sustains it still Your word defends